Welcome to Technovation. I'm Peter High. My guest today is Mike Wondrish. Mike is the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Avantor, a role he's held for a bit more than three years now. Avantor is a leading global provider of integrated, tailored solutions for the life sciences and advanced technology industries with over $6 billion in annual revenue. Mike's been a past global uh, leader at, at firms in, in the technology space as the CTO of Pepsi, as the uh, CTO of Bungie as well, among other roles that he has held. Mike, great to see you today. Yeah, great to be here, Peter. Looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, I, I just gave a brief uh, thumbnail sketch as to uh, uh, Vontor's business. I wonder if you could maybe take a, a moment longer and describe a little bit further what it is that Avantor does. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, it, it, first of all, it's a fantastic organization that, you know, I just passed my three-year anniversary, as, as you uh, alluded to, and it, it feels like it's been about six months. It's going so so quickly. Um, you know, we're in, in a space that um, became in the center of the map faster than, than I think anyone would have guessed. So we um, are a manufacturing distributor of just about anything that's in, in a lab, from uh, chemicals we manufacture all the way through beakers. So we call ourselves from, from beaker to bulk. Uh, so from discovery to production, um, of, we do a lot of proprietary chemical manufacturing, uh, ultra pure chemicals, uh, all the way through large equipment centrifuges. Um, so we're in the middle of, as you mentioned, biopharma, healthcare, education and government, advanced materials. Um, so we work, uh, you know, with the aerospace industry, et cetera, um, you know, all, all the way to uh, playing a key role in, in COVID therapy and vaccine development. So really tremendous space, um, super, uh, super quick for how fast it's moving and, and uh, couldn't be happier to, to be with the organization. That's fantastic. Talk a bit about the role that uh, technology and digital plays. I, there's a lot of what you just described at the top line of, of what the organization does that has a real physical element to it. But naturally, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and information behind all of that. I can only imagine that the the digital and technology uh, aspects of, of what goes into the development of all that you described is pretty profound. Take a moment to describe that if you would. Yeah, I, um... I will say that that uh, probably as much as any company I've been a part of, um, you know, Michael, our CEO, and the board of the management team are incredibly um, advanced in their thinking on on what role technology and digital should play in in advancing the agenda for the corporation. Uh, we talk about uh, ultimately our, our mission of um, you know accelerating the speed of science um, and and the the role that digital has to play in that from integrating the supply chain to using data uh, for scientific research um, to integrating all the assets we have within our organization. So um, we were one of the largest mergers um, of two companies, the former Avantor and the former BWR in 2017, both of which were very acquisitive organizations um, and uh, had a tremendous asset base of companies that were acquired. And part of what we're doing is is integrating those assets uh, for for utilization across our customer base. Um, so we do a, a truly integrated operating model. Uh, we run, you know, a significant majority of our of our business through e-commerce right now. So north of of seventy percent of our business. So that's a very tangible example of of uh, you mentioned uh, north of six billion dollars. How we run our revenue through. Uh, but integrated supply chain all the way through uh, the, the suppliers. So um, really, really committed to, to both um, technology for our customers. So inventory management platforms, uh, e-commerce platforms, equipment management platforms for our customers, uh, all the way through uh, how we operate internally as a, a globally integrated uh, company. I want to stick with that point that you mentioned twice there, the integrated uh, supply chain. You've mentioned uh, when we've spoken previously that the barriers between customers and suppliers are fading. Uh, talk a bit about the that, that topic a little bit more and its implications on your business. Yeah, it's, it's a topic I'm, I'm super passionate about. I, I th if we think or if I think historically, you know, everyone used to look to optimize the supply chain within the four walls of the organization and then you had more point-to-point -point connectivity with suppliers back downstream and customers upstream. Now, um, really, the goal is how do I have my customers feel like they're part of my organization? How do I have my suppliers feel like they're part of my organization and, and have a truly integrated supply chain, whether it's for inventory visibility, whether it's for co-innovation 
which we do a tremendous amount of with our customers. And I think the most natural example of that, honestly, is the speed at which these COVID vaccines were developed. Never in the history of science has anything moved this quickly. That only happened because of how the entire supply chain worked together. Um, and so I, I think we've set the new standard. I don't think this is a one-off um, just because, I, you know, in my air quotes, that, that it was a global pandemic. I think this is the expectation for how science is going to move in the future. We've proven it can happen, um, and it happens because of the supply chain working together. Yeah, very interesting. And obviously, uh, uh, an existential crisis that an organization like yours has been critical in in helping us all through. I'd, all, I'd be interested if we could stick with that a little bit longer. What, what an unusual year and change it has been through the course of the pandemic. As you point out, a lot of, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, there's been a lot of necessity in the past 15 or 16 months. Uh Talk, talk a bit about some of the further learnings from that. You, you talked about how in some ways it is reset the way in which business is done. And I believe I'm hearing you say reset for good, that even during, you know, quote unquote, normal times to come, let's hope sooner rather than later, that the the the, the new ways of operating are likely to remain. I'd be interested in having you speak a little bit further about the broader implications of that, if you would. Yeah, I think there's, there's so many prongs to that. Um, you know, you could go with, how it's affecting uh, the workforce globally. Um, so obviously everyone virtually overnight went from a office-based culture to work from home. And you know, who would have thought that you know, 14, 15 months later, we're still speaking to each other you know, from, our, from our home offices. Uh, I don't think anyone would have, would have forecasted this model to continue, but the more you look at it and the more you look at some of the flexibility it provides to, to associates, um, how you can engage talent on a global basis, um, how you can get closer to your customers, quite frankly. I think the, the operating model fundamentally will, will change for, for many, many companies um, on what the office, the purpose of the office is, what global recruiting, global talent looks like. So I, I think that's a prong. Um, Self-sufficiency. So what tools do you put in your associate's hands from data and analysis to collaboration tools, to integration tools um, through the through the supply chain. I keep man mentioning that the supply chain, but supply the definition of supply chain is has changed. Um, to ultimately overnight in, in trying to do um, demand forecasting of of our products and anything you thought you knew about demand forecasting was thrown out the door. Um, everything you thought you had structured and thought you had efficient it just changed overnight. So. How does a, a dynamic demand forecast look like? And, and that can only happen by getting closer to customers and consumers. And I would say lastly, and we've talked about it for, for a lot of years, and I think the acceleration um, via the work from home is, is probably advanced, it, is the consumerization of IT, um, bringing the commercial or consumer experience to, to the corporate world. Um, when you talk about productivity and measuring associate productivity and how can I tell now that everyone isn't together in an office, am I still getting the same output or, or in fact, advancing my output? How do I make it easier for people to work together? Um, I think that that only works because we're, we're thinking more in the, in the consumer mindset and less in the corporate, I will give you the tools that you will need instead of you tell me what you need to be productive and I'll find a way to make it work within our environment. Um, so it's a, it's a slight different mindset shift. So. You talked about how uh, Avantor is really the the combination of uh, a merger between uh, Avantor and VWR uh, four years ago. It, two organizations, as you highlighted, were very acquisitive as well. And it sounds like a lot of the work pre-pandemic, not that you knew that there was any preparation towards a, something like that, uh, was around um, weaving the fabric t more tightly in, within the organization, perhaps setting standards, uh, modernizing the, the footprint of the, the company and, and making it a bit more holistic as opposed to perhaps the, the, the different parts and pieces having, you know, kind of different ways of doing things as, as the default perhaps as may have been the historical norm. I can only imagine actually that the, the work done in the early parts of your tenure as CIO served the organization well over the course of the past year uh, as the need to be nimble required, uh, you know, a, a, more, a greater degree of flexibility that may not have been there, but for some of the work that you and your team were doing 
uh, in the first couple of years of your tenure as, as chief information officer. But I wonder if you could reflect on that a little bit. Uh, I think it's a great observation, Peter. I, I think, um, you know, when I came into the organization, that the goal was how do we have one plus one equal three and not two? Um, so how do we how do we take advantage of all these fantastic assets that we have and get closer to our customers? You know, one of the one of the big drivers was how do we become extremely customer centric from a science standpoint and how do we enable that? So um, we've invested very, very heavily in our digital products footprint. Um, as I mentioned, the significant majority of our business goes through goes through e-commerce today. Um, offering platforms to help our customers do inventory management and do equipment management all the way through um, truly integrating, um, you know, the, the, all the ERP systems that we had through all the different acquisitions. So um, which gave us visibility to global data, which gave us visibility to um, inventory across the business, um, gave us visibility to 360 view of customers. Um, so if we're going to customer ABC, with three different business lines, how do we come together with what's the true value prop? And, and that was that was the driver behind the business, that there were so many great assets that that were being leveraged individually and maybe not as much together. And so the 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 effort that we put in in, in the lead up to pre-pandemic times really I think made it easier for us to accelerate um, over the last year from you know what we could do externally from a commerce standpoint, because immediately Folks that didn't have, uh, you know, kind of the foundational aspects of, of commerce or digital integration really struggled early on, didn't have the, the tools to enable work from home for their associates, struggled early on. Um, and, uh, and we had a, a tremendous demand, both upstream and downstream, from, hey, we want to digitally integrate with you. We want to get rid of paper. We can't operate that way anymore. So um, I, I felt like we were in a, in a pretty good position and, and, uh, Really, we're, we're looking out strategically for how do we continue to, to help drive uh, where we were trying to take the business. Yours as an organization, given the business that you're in, where a significant percentage of, of the company couldn't operate virtually, uh, given the, the the tactile nature of what you're producing, that they're they're manufacturing, uh, you know, facilities, and and I wonder if there are learnings. A lot, some organizations, everyone went virtual, and so the entire population of a company was experiencing a, a common set of 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 new realities. Let's say, whereas yours was really a a hybrid through much of the pandemic. I wonder if there are any learnings in collaborating with p- some people in 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 uh, production facilities or other offices of the organization, while others like yourself uh, were operating primarily from home, if there were any any interesting aspects to that that level of collaboration across a, 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 a several different sorts of settings? Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting topic. Um, we see every day the real heroes in our company are the our essential workers that, that in our factories and our distribution centers that we have all over the world. You know, not only did they not have the benefit of working from home, we in fact were looking to increase output because the demand went so high. So these folks came into the DCs every single day and and really were the backbone for for driving what we were doing. So, you know, it it was truly and still is a very hybrid environment for us with the amount of technology that we have in our plants and our distribution centers, making sure that it stays up and running, make sure that you know, we have safety protocols in place to to allow people to safely come to the office. That we have the staff that can support you know the 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 networks, the conveyors, the the picking and packing machines, the the barcode readers. You know everything that's going on, and you know running in many of our locations twenty four by seven. Um, and then the the more traditional office workers like myself, like finance, you know, like HR. That suddenly everyone's working from home, and and um, you know for the, for the leaders that had global roles, being on videos and audios, you know all day, it wasn't a huge change. You know you missed the personal interaction in the office, but you know many of us traveled quite a bit to make sure that you're able to to visit your teams all over the world and get to the plants and what can we do to make you more efficient. So it, it really was how do we get all the blockers out of the way for our essential workers that that have been the heroes for us. 
Very interesting. I wanted to also ask you, you've been a chief technology officer twice at two colossal organizations in Bungie and Pepsi. You're now the chief information officer of Avantor. I wonder what, you know, what, what's in a title? Are you, uh, do, do you have any sort of affinity to one versus the other? Do you, are there significant differences, obviously very significant differences in each of those companies? But um, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the CTO versus the CIO and the responsibilities you've held. Yeah, um, I will say a, a title is very company specific. Um, you know, some organizations here, uh, when I joined, we had a CTO, uh, chief technology officer, and his role was focused on, he was our, our chief scientific officer. Um, so uh, I think it is very, very company specific. Um, you know, in some of my roles, you know, one of the, the chief technology officer roles was um, enterprise architecture, information, and user computing. So it was the entire technology backbone. And then we had functional CIOs that essentially were the, the business partner leads or business unit leads. Um, so I was, I, I was the supply side and they were the demand side, as we called it. Um, you know, here uh, in my role as CIO, so we've got a, a team that focuses on the, on, the, uh, on the demand side. So we've got a, a business re- relationship management function and we've got delivery functions as well. So uh, um, I, I probably don't get real caught up in the title and, and more on, you know, what's the, the philosophy of the individual company on, on the value of technology? Is it a strategic differentiator? Is it a, a way to do business? Is it a cost of doing business? Is it an inhibitor? Um, I've been fortunate to be part of some fantastic organizations that have, have always viewed technology as an enabler and a strategic differentiator. Um, you mentioned a number of them, Mars, Amerisource, Bergen, and some of the other ones. I love that. I love, I love driving business change enabled by technology. Um, I like to say I don't walk around with my uh, my uh, tool belt of technology. That that's not who I am. I, I can talk it. It's my background. But I love business change enabled by technology. And you know, folks don't know that I'm the CIO when we sit in a room. I've had a great day. Uh, I think my, my my job really is is the, the same as any other business executive sitting around the table. Um, how do we enable the strategy and do it quickly? That's a great, great response. I, I also wanted to ask you, um, as you look to the future, what are some trends that particularly excite you that are beginning to make their way onto your roadmap? Yeah, I would say probably for the for the first time ever, um, the, the practical application of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, it's It's been in some pocket areas. And, you know, I, I uh, many, many years ago, um, uh, studied uh, artificial intelligence in grad school, and, and that's actually what my background is in. So it's been interesting to see how long it's taken us to get to true broad-based practical application of these technologies. Um, I think the technology was ahead of kind of the use cases, and I think some of it was we didn't have the compute horsepower to solve some of the problems we can today. So I think the real-world application of, of uh, machine learning and AI uh, to solve problems, for you talk about automation, you talk about driving efficiency so we can redeploy, you know, the fantastic associates we have with more advanced roles in the organization. Um, I think that's a, a really big one. Um, I think as uh, network technologies um, have become much more efficient, it allows us to deploy um, devices, IoT, um, for much uh, broader application within, within our facilities. Um, you know, you do time-based studies. Ultimately, my goal is to make research scientists have the majority of their time spent on research and not administrative topics. Do they have the right products for the right research at the right time in the right place? Um, I can't do that if the, the time is spent doing administrative functions. So if I can automate those activities, just-in-time inventory, uh, understanding what research workflows they're working on, um, and We've deployed things um, doing predictive analysis. We call it recommendations engine. So can I recommend based upon my knowledge of what research they're doing, what product set or what their shopping basket might look like? Um, If I know that there are shortages of certain materials that there are in many parts of the world right now, um, can I recommend alternatives that won't adversely affect uh, the research they're doing? So we call it cross-referencing. Can I provide uh, viable cross-referencing such that it becomes completely opaque to the scientist. Uh, so I think the the applicability of some of these um, sensors that that have been, um, you know, 
playing around with in the past. So they're, they're nice in, in DCs and warehouses, uh, DCs and manufacturing locations. But now if I can put it in a research facility and I can actually tell where and what the volumes are left of individual proprietary chemicals, suddenly I'm doing demand forecasting of uh, chemicals that I can send it all the way back to my manufacturing team. Um, so I think that that's a, a second area. And then ultimately, I think, um, you know, supply chain transparency that, that we keep talking about, um, the, the ability um, to connect all the way through from, so we're not just moving large chunks of data, we're actually having real-time integration across systems, securely, obviously, um, but real-time integration through the supply chain. Well, Mike Wondrich, uh, really appreciate you taking time with me on Technovation today, covering your career path, uh, covering the integration work that you and your team undertook to uh, better digest a major merger in, uh, of two organizations that were themselves quite acquisitive, the advantages of having done so uh, and played out through the the uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, pandemic and quarantine, learnings from that experience uh, as an organization that uh, was on the front line and helping develop remedies uh, for it, and a variety of other topics. It's really been a great conversation. Yeah, Peter, I always, uh, always have a great conversation with you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the time and opportunity to chat today.